All right. So we're starting off with a picture that's kind of familiar, uh, where we have a triangle and we're going to be trying to find the unknown side lengths and angles. Now, no, this is not the same one that you saw before on the triangle parts assignment. But the stuff we're doing today and on Friday will actually show you some different ways that that could have been approached as well. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, ways to find the missing side lengths and angles here. And of course, we do have a triangle on a coordinate plane. So we can actually know what the coordinates of these points are. And so I went ahead and named them A, B, and C here. And so in this particular case, though, once I know those coordinates, I really don't need all the rest of the grid. And so for this particular example, at least, and seeing how we could go about it, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get rid of that grid. And then as I'm looking at this picture now, I want to be able to figure this out. And right now, all we have is some coordinates. And yeah, we could actually try to go about doing this by like drawing in the rectangles around it, like this sort of a thing. But I don't want to have to do it that way every single time. There are some shortcuts that we can find. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to lead us into one of those shortcuts by instead drawing in the altitude of this one. Uh, because this does have its uh, horizontal side on the horizontal, we can get away with doing that. And so I'm actually going to use that in this particular case to find some unknown pieces of it. All right. So if I want to find the unknowns here, well, I'm going to need some room to work. So let me move that over there. And I don't want to have to write out the long name. So I'm going to write, I'm going to go ahead and label some side lengths here. I'm going to call this side, side A over here. Um, notice little a, side A, is always opposite from angle A. Uh, that will always be the case. And if you forget that, some of the stuff you see today is going to get confusing. So you definitely want to make sure you remember that capital A is the angle, lowercase a is the side that is opposite angle A. All right. So that would be A. That means this one down here on the bottom would be little b. And uh, this then would be C over here. That is a lowercase c. All right. So I now need to find the lengths. Now, because I dropped down the height of this one, that means I actually have a right triangle on both sides of that. And so I can actually use my regular right triangle trigonometry to find those. And so for instance, then, uh, let's see here. It looks like I'm going to need to find the height of this one in order to then be able to find the other pieces. So I'm going to go ahead and find that here first. So to find the height, and let's see here. Actually, to know the height, no, no. I actually don't know the height. You know what? I need to know those side lengths. I can find those side lengths, right? I can find those because I can know how long these are. So. For instance, the height here. I actually can know the height without having to do any calculations because notice it's going from negative one zero up to negative one twelve. That means my height here is twelve. Okay, and actually I can find all a bunch of these other ones too. Like B is actually split up into two parts. AD would be five units wide. DC would be from negative one to eight. So that's nine units wide, which means that B then is a grand total of 14 units. So I can figure that out. And actually, since I know the height and I know those two parts of the base, I could actually figure out what A and C are as well uh, because I could use Pythagorean theorem on those. Okay, so I got the five and the 12 in this triangle. So I can use Pythagorean theorem there. So five squared plus 12 squared, that'd be 25 plus 144. That's 169. The square root of 169 is 13. Yes, that is one of our nice, pretty Pythagorean triples. Almost like I chose the numbers that way. Oh, wait. Uh, and then uh, I could find side A using Pythagorean theorem as well. Uh, there, my leg lengths are 9 and 12. So 9 squared plus 12 squared, take the square root of that, that'd be 15. Yes, that is another one of those triangles. That's actually our scaled up version of the 3, 4, 5 triangle. Okay, so now I've actually been able to figure out all of the lengths, but I still need an angle, right? 
Okay, now I guess we got to actually delve into our trigonometry. Okay, uh, let's start by trying to find, I'll try to find angle C to start with. Uh, that's just an arbitrary choice. I could have started with A as well. So uh, C, I can uh, actually choose which ones I go with here because I do know all three sides of that triangle. In this particular case though, I'm gonna to choose to use, I'll use the 12 and the 15. So that would be sine of C equals the opposite 12 over the hypotenuse 15. And then I can actually figure out what C is, right? So let's go ahead and figure out what the measure of angle C is. So I'm gonna do 12 divided by 15. And then we're gonna do inverse sine of that. Uh, notice I do wanna actually stick with degrees here because we're looking at regular angle measures in a triangle and those are always in degrees. You'll never see these done in radians. So then that would be about 53.13 degrees. Okay. Uh, now I could actually go through and then I could like find A, right? So like if I wanted to find A, I would do sine of A equals 12 over 13. And then I could calculate that, right? Uh, from here, you all know the calculations. You don't need me to actually go through and tell you what the numbers are. This is the kind of stuff you've done many times before. It's much more comfortable uh, because it's now just the right triangle trigonometry. But in what we just did here, notice that I ended up using this height. I ended up using it in both of these calculations. And that actually leads us into our topic for today, which is the law of sines. Because it turns out that we could even generalize this a bit. Because, and again, actually, I need to go back and label those side lengths with how they were before. So this was A, this was C, this was B down here. And we got our height, of course. So notice what I ended up doing was I ended up doing for that first calculation, I did sine of C equals the opposite, which was H, over the hypotenuse, which was A. Okay. And then... Uh, for the other one, I was doing sine of A equals uh, H over C in that case. This may not look all that significant at the moment, but you'll notice that both of these formulas include H. If they both include H, we can actually solve this for H for both of them. And then we can actually put them in together to make a single equation instead of two separate ones. So let me do that here. So for the first one, I multiply both sides by A. So that would be A times sine of C equals H. The second one, I'd multiply both sides by C. So that'd be C times sine of A equals H. And of course, if they both equal H, then they must equal each other. And so we can then say, that A times sine of C equals C times sine of A. Right now, I mean, that's true and that's very useful, but uh, it actually tends to be presented in a slightly different way because it's a little bit tricky to remember it in this exact format. Instead, notice that if I, divided both sides, for instance, by the side length. So I divide both sides by A and then divide both sides by C. I would end up with sine of C over C equals sine of A over A. This right here ends up being a much smaller formula that we could have used. In fact, Remember what we did on this last calculation here where we found H and then use that as part of our calculations? It turns out you could actually skip finding H entirely. We didn't even actually need to find H in order to be able to do that. 
which is so weird, but it's totally true that we didn't actually even need the H value. We could have gone straight to just uh, that proportion and use that by generalizing it. That fact leads us into our big lesson for today, our big formula for today. Because this that you see here is actually just a piece of the law of signs. Where if we kept going with that, we could actually create the same ratio. We'd find we have the same connection with the B. This is what needs to go into your notes. The law of signs right here. And so be writing this down, please. And some of you have seen law of signs before and some of you haven't. For those of you who have seen it, uh, what I just went through is the derivation of law of signs. So you should be able to understand it at a deeper level, I hope at least. All right, now, as you take a look at this, at the law of signs, notice that it is constructed in such a way, we purposefully do it in this order with the fractions because it's a little bit easier to remember this way. Because notice, side A and angle A go together. So the sine of angle A over side length A will equal any of those proportions. And so this allows us to figure out a lot of unknowns. Now, before we go too much deeper here, I do wanna show you, uh, right now I wrote it with sine A over A. You could also write it as A over sine A. They're proportions. So yes, this would also work. You will actually see this written either way because either way is valid. So it's not particularly picky about which way you have it written in, in that regard. Okay, just so you know, you don't certainly have to memorize it two separate times or anything like that, but I want you aware that it works either way. The last thing that I will note out of this is notice we can use this to find lots of unknowns, but in order to do that, we have to have one of these fractions wholly known. So in other words, I would need to have, for instance, side A and angle A both if I then wanted to figure out uh, B or C. I need to have three parts in one of these. I cannot just have two parts. And I also cannot, for instance, have all of the side lights and be able to figure out the angles. Uh, we wouldn't have, it because we had just grabbed one pair of fractions. So we can't work with all three at the same time. We have to pick a pair. And then that would give us two unknowns within that pair. So we need to know three things, but one of those three things has to be a pair of angles and sides that go together. All right, that's the big idea of law of signs. Now it's a chance to put it in practice. So here's the first problem that we're gonna be working out together on this. So please write this one down and then, yeah, we'll work it together on this first one at least. And you'll notice here, there's no triangle drawn. It's assumed that you're gonna know what the triangle should look like just because of how it is named. Remember, capital letters are always your angles. Lowercase letters are always your side lengths. And the lowercase letter is always opposite its uppercase equivalent. And so that's what we're gonna be using on this. Uh, so what that means for those of you who are more visual, if I were gonna try to draw it out, A, B, C, Side A is always opposite angle A. Side B is always opposite angle B. And side C is always opposite angle C. 
got to be able to just kind of know that by looking at the information given. So we don't have to draw that whole thing out every time. All right. So then, uh, in order to be able to solve this then, before today, we would have to have gone through a bunch of hoops. We would have to have like drawn out the triangle, drawn some uh, rectangle around it, or drawn in some altitudes, something like that, in order to be able to figure it out. But of course, we don't even have coordinates. They would all have to be off in space, and we'd have to figure out some way to wrangle that. But the law of sines allows us a way to do this. We can actually do it just by knowing this formula. And so if I take the pieces that I know out of that formula and plug it in, this is what I'm looking at. Now, right now, actually, no, I shouldn't say that yet. Go ahead and take a moment and write that down. Let me give you a chance to do that. All right, so at the moment, we actually would have a little bit of a problem with this one because normally I would grab uh, any two of the fractions. So for instance, I might grab these first two and I might then try to solve that proportion so I could figure out what the unknown is. But you'll notice here, there's two unknowns in those. Remember, I was just talking about how we need to know a corresponding angle and side pair in order to be able to pull this off. And it doesn't look like we have that here. And at the very start, we technically aren't just given that. That's true. However, we can find it fairly easily. Because uh, you notice that we know two angle measures. We can find the third. It's a triangle after all. And we know that all of the angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees. So if I want to know what B equals, I can do the 180 minus 80 degrees and 35 degrees. And I'll tell me angle B. So if I do that, uh, 180 minus 80, of course that's 100, 100 minus 35, then would give me 65. And so then I can know that angle B is actually 65 degrees. Add that into your problem there, update your equation accordingly. And because I now know that angle measure, notice that means I also know both the top and bottom of that fraction. That's what I needed. I needed to have both the top and the bottom numbers known in one of the fractions. And now that I have that, I can find the other two unknowns. I can now find side A and side C. So let's go ahead and do that now. So for finding side A, I'm gonna grab the fraction that has that in it. So I'm gonna do sine of 35. Oops, there we go over A equals sine of 65 over 20. Now we have a proportion. We solve the proportion from here. And so you know how to do that part, I think, from here. So go ahead and take like 30 seconds to a minute. Go ahead and solve this proportion for A, and then I'll show the work uh, so you can check it. Please make sure your calculator is in degree mode for this. If you're in radian mode, everything will go sideways. Now put the work up that we do in order to be able to solve this. Uh, we cross multiply and then we solve from there. And you should be finding that side length A here, I'm gonna go ahead and round it to two decimals. There's nothing magic about that. It's just what I tend to default to. And since we weren't told, I'll just default to what I normally do. Uh, if you ran into something slightly different, that's okay. So I get about 
and it's 6574. Since it's 57, I'm going to call this 66. Yes, we still have to use the proper rounding rules at each step along the way. Notice this is lowercase a. That means that it's side length a. And so there's no units to put on this. It's not degrees. It's not an angle. So there's no degree symbol on it for that reason. Sometimes we really want to throw the degrees on, but we don't for that reason. Okay, any questions on this very first one? If not, take what we just did, use it as an example. Please find side C. All right, so here's my setup. I want to make sure that you came up with the same original setup before you finish this one out. Notice I chose to use uh, the Bs again. I chose to still use this fraction. And some of you might have been inclined instead to use this one because we just found length A. So technically we could. However, A is an approximation, the one that we have written down here. It's 12.66. Unless you're going to put that into the memory of your calculator so you can draw back that same number later, you'll probably end up ending up, you will probably end up using and experiencing some rounding error if you try using this in your next calculation. Because B is fully known, exactly known, I would recommend you stick with using the B ones because that way you don't run into that rounding error. Okay, finish solving it out from there. All right, and at the end of that problem, you can see the work I did and the answer I got of about 21.73. All right, so you've now seen a complete example using the law of signs. Any questions coming out of uh, this process so far? All right, I'm not hearing any questions coming off this first one. All right, then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna run through a couple more examples where you can just basically take this whole process start to finish now, All right? So on to the next one. In this case, I'm giving you the information as a picture. Still works the same way, but you might have to do a little naming on your own. Write down the problem, of course, but then go ahead and work it out on your own paper. 
as you do so, I will start working a little bit behind you. Hopefully you're always a little bit ahead of me and just checking your work. If you get stuck, maybe I'll give you a clue up here. As I'm working this one through, you notice the first thing I'm doing is I'm labeling my triangle. Um, I just want to be able to have variable names in there for them. Uh, I'm choosing to label mine this way as A, B, and C and going with those particular letters. You might have chosen different letters and that's okay. You just need to name them something. All right, so you can see here the original setup that I'm using. Uh, regardless of what you named your particular parts, you should at least be able to see where the numbers go in the whole deal. And a couple of other little things, like in this case, the one where I know the 95 and the 42 had ended up in the middle. There's nothing special about ending up in the middle. That one could have been written first for all I care. It doesn't matter as long as each fraction is internally consistent. All right, now at this point, you might be saying, no, there's a problem. I can't solve for A because there's two unknowns in the A fraction. You're right, there are. However, we can figure out what C is. So let's start there and see what we can do at that point. So that's where I'm gonna start because there's two A unknowns in that fraction. I'm going to the other one to start with.
All right, so when I did that work to figure out what uh, angle C was, I ended up with 51.51 degrees. And you might be saying, well, okay, but that still doesn't help us with A because we still don't know what A is. However, notice that means I just figured out C here. It's 51.51. That means I now know two angles out of my triangle. If I know those two angles out of my triangle, I can figure out the third angle. So I can actually just use those two angles to find out what angle A is. So if you're stuck on A, you can find A by doing 180 minus the other two angles. So do that if you haven't yet. And then, of course, once I know angle A, I can go find side A. And you'll notice that when we set that one up, that we do have a decimal, our rounded answer in our calculation. Uh, however much I possibly can, I am going to try to use the entire decimal that's showing on my calculator when I do this work. All right. So if you are familiar with using the memory function on your calculator, you could do that. You could also just make sure that's the very first calculation you do. And there is my work that I end up doing to find side A. I ended up getting about 23.26 for side A there. All right, now, a note on this. Uh, yes, that's a, actually a pretty exact answer. There's no rounding error in my answer there. All that's happened is it's just been rounded to the 100. I was able to keep that exact because I went back and I did this calculation on my calculator. I did 180 minus 95 minus the 51.51. that was still showing on my calculator from before. So I knew that was exact. So my calculator is actually showing 33.4 a something. It was a big long decimal. That number was still showing on my calculator when I headed over here. So the very first thing I did is with that still just showing on my calculator, I did sign of that number. And that way I didn't experience the rounding error. I didn't come up with that at all. And so that then gave me the exact number for that. So then I just took that number times 42, divided it by the sine of 95 to be able to get that final number there. All right, we're gonna do one more example together here. Any questions though about how we did this one before we go on to that last one? All right, then last problem that we're gonna be doing together here. So please find the unknown uh, triangle parts of this one.
And again, I need to choose some uh, names. I'm just following the same kind of pattern I've used before. You again could have given them different names, but this is the one I'm going to be using in my calculations if you want to be the same. My particular naming led me to that particular setup. And that particular setup tells me I want to start by finding angle C. So you can see my calculations here for how I found uh, the rest of the angles. I still have to find uh, side length B, but you can check your work leading into that part. And remember to keep that angle showing on your calculator as you do head into the next part so you can be exact with the calculations.
All right, and there is our value for B. All right. Coming out of this problem, any questions or anything you want to check on or ask about? No? You sure about that? Look more closely. I think I got a different answer for um, small b, the side. And you might have, and it kind of depends on what you ended up doing with it. Yeah. Uh, if it's just a calculation thing, compare your calculations, but it might also be something bigger as an idea. A couple of people put in chat something about C there, like uh, Sai said, C is less than 90 degrees. Uh, yeah, in our calculations over here, uh, C ended up being 63 and a half degrees or so. That would be this angle. That doesn't exactly look like 63 degrees, right? That looks like it's C should be actually be an obtuse angle. Well, there's a reason for that. Uh, and yes, this triangle is actually drawn to scale. So this isn't one of those situations where it's just like, oh yeah, it's not drawn to scale, don't worry about it. Which I know that happens a lot of math classes. But no, I actually drew this to scale using the correct calculations. And yet our formula, which is correct, doesn't seem to make sense with that. Actually, what we just found was the dimensions of this triangle. This angle here looks like about 63 degrees. And in fact, it is. This is actually the triangle that we just found. So what happened here? Well, notice that we found C by doing inverse sine there. If we think about our unit circle, let's actually draw that out a little bit. If we think about our unit circle, um, sine of 60 degrees would be the y coordinate of that angle out there at 60 degrees. It's the y coordinate, right? Well, notice that that y coordinate would be the same as this angle over here, which is an obtuse angle. The problem is that inverse sine only ever gives us the first angle for which that is the, the sine. There's actually multiple angles. In fact, there's actually technically an infinite number of angles if you keep going around the circle over and over and over again. And so inverse sine doesn't tell us every possible angle, but rather the first possible angle. And it so happens that when we're dealing with law of sines, that could potentially cause us a problem, okay? Uh, what ends up being kind of the red flag that tells us that this could be a problem in this one was actually that B ended up being obtuse. If your last angle ends up being obtuse, it's possible that you've just fallen into what we call the ambiguous case for law of sines. If you think back to geometry, remember when you're doing all the triangle congruency stuff? Remember that side-side uh, angle, oops, that's not the highlighter, there we go, that side-side angle could not be used to prove that two triangles were congruent. Uh, it, the reason is because, again, I'm going to flip back and forth between these. Take a look at the picture that I drew down originally. Notice that both of these have the same angle and the same sides. The key is that between these two sides that we know, the 5 and the 11, the angle is not between them, but rather outside of them. Hence why we call it side-side angle, not side-angle-side. Side-side angle cannot prove congruency because there's multiple ones that we can create based on that information. In fact, there's exactly two different triangles that we could create based on that information if an obtuse angle is involved. Now, if everything comes out acute, no problem. You can know that side-side angle is still doable. However, if one of them ends up obtuse, you can't actually ever be sure 
which triangle you're trying to find the pieces for because two are possible. So this is the last little note about law of signs is I just want you aware that there is this thing called the ambiguous case. And that just means that the law of signs will find one possible triangle, but that there could be two, all right? So I just want that on your radar. That's not gonna come up as a big thing like in your assignment or anything. You're not gonna have to like figure out both possible triangles today or anything. But I want you to realize that it is a thing and that is a possibility and it's something that can occur and does occur depending on what the exact triangle dimensions are. Okay. All right, uh, let's see here. I wanna go back really quick here because uh, when I started, a uh, few people had still come trickling in. I wanna put this up real quick. This is the notes that we took earlier. If you were not here at the start of class, you might wanna screenshot this real quick. I'm probably not gonna leave it up long enough for everyone to totally write it down, but this is what our big notes that everything is based off of. So notice law of signs. Uh, I again tended to do it where I put the sign on top. I did angle over side. Remember, you don't have to. If you do it the other way, like even if you saw this before and you learned it the other way, go with it. It doesn't change anything. You'll end up in the exact same places. All right, so then 